I welcome you to turn your Bible with me to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, we're several weeks, eight weeks into our series in James, How Do I Grow in Spiritual Maturity? In a faith that is vibrant and active and alive. That's the key, the key one there. And, and we achieve the spiritual maturity, and we've been using this five-section series in James. And I hope you have an outline in addition to your Bible. And you can see that part of the outline on the right there, Stand with confidence. That was the first section. We're really indebted to Dr. Blue, as I've shared with you, for this uh, for this outline. We stand with confidence, and then we serve with compassion. We speak with care, and then finally, in chapter four here, we submit with contrition, with this sense of confession and a desire to do things differently. And that's the section we're in today, the fourth of five. And so we've got several more weeks in in this series. Four more after this week. But we're starting in James chapter 4. I hope you're there with me. I hope you have those communion supplies with you as well. Two key issues. One is this selfish conflict, this, this selfish desire that we have, this desire to, do, to focus on ourselves and what our needs are and pleasure and fulfilling what we want, and then the conflict that results from that. So this selfish conflict that comes through our selfish desire and, and then it leads to anger and it leads to fights and bitterness and bickering. And, and James himself in this uh, letter, he writes very practically and he tells us about different kinds. And it's not really part of his um, approach, but we see that it's nothing new, this conflict. And he mentions, and I like how some commentators have highlighted this, that there, he talks about class wars. Um, in James chapter 1, you know, between the rich and the poor. He talks about employment wars, you know, in, in, in James chapter 5. We haven't gotten there yet. He talks about church fights back in, in chapter 1 and in chapter 3, and then personal wars, and we see that a little bit later in chapter 4 when we look at uh, another part of the chapter next week. And so there's always something to fight about in the ancient world and today. And so our selfish desires take us places take us places that we don't really want to go and has impact and we have this contentious life. And there's a lot of selfish desire in our culture and it's pretty obvious right now that there's a lot of conflict in our culture. Whether it's over politics or over COVID or over race and all uh, cities versus rural folks, there's all kinds of ways to have conflict. And a lot of that conflict, James teaches us, stems from our selfish desire. And he's writing to the church, so we gotta, we got to clean up our act. And I know we want to see our culture maybe behave differently, but you know, things start with us. So let's look at James chapter 4. We submit with contrition, turning hatred into humility. Because what happens a lot when our selfish desire is unfulfilled or we don't get what we want, there's conflict, and that conflict use, heads us toward Hate, and we're you know we're on that needle, and, and somewhere on that needle, we're heading toward hate. Where uh, what James taught us earlier uh, in the letter is that we're to love our neighbor as ourself. So let's look, James chapter four, starting in verse one. Let's consider the source of the conflict. And so he asks, you know, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And he's just finished up with peacemaking and and reconciliation and and wisdom's grace and wisdom's peace and and wisdom's humility, and that's at the end of chapter 3. And so, but then he, he turns the corner and says, okay, if we're not peacemakers, what are we, and what does that look like? And so what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? So our conflict on the outside often is derives from the conflict on the inside. The conflict on the outside exposes the selfish desire conflict that we have on the inside. And our selfish desire leads to conflict. And I think about that in my own life. When I was a kid, you know, our parents assigned my siblings and I chores. And, and my brother and I were, were close to the same age, and he's a little bit older. And, and so we'd uh, get the task to clean the kitchen. And not just to clean the kitchen separately, but to clean the kitchen together. And our home was, uh, was kind of partitioned off so our parents could kind of just leave us to do our thing. And I remember we'd go in the kitchen and we'd see it wasn't this huge kitchen. It wasn't particularly a big mess. My mom was uh, wonderful at, at uh, kind of keeping control of our house, right? But she had some chores for us and so did Dad. 
And so we, we'd go in and we'd work on how we would divide out who did what. Because instead of working together, we each wanted our own deal. That way if one person got slow or fast or whatever, we could say, hey, here's my part, I did it and it's done. And we'd argue over what part of the kitchen to clean and we would try to divide it out and we would argue over it. And I, and I remember thinking neither of us really wanted to get more or get taken advantage of and wanted, you know, and our, our selfish desire it created this conflict between us and we would spend more time arguing than cleaning. It's kind of goofy. And our selfish desire leads to conflict. And that's not just for kids, but that's, that's, that's for all of us. And so we got to consider the source of our conflict. Our selfish desire produces this conflict with other people. And so James highlights that at the beginning of verse 2. You desire, but you don't have. It's like, well, I want something, I don't got it. And he says, and he uses the extreme example, so you kill. You say, well, wait a second. You know, I'm not going out and killing anybody. I get that. James, James is using extreme example to make a point. That the, the, when we desire what we don't have, and that's at the, its ultimate fruition is murder, right? And he says, you covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. And that, well, okay, that's more like us. I might not be a murderer, but man, I covet and I, I can't get what I want. I like what one person said about this, and he wrote this. Thou shalt not covet is the, covet is the last of God's Ten Commandments, but its violation can make, it, make us break all the other nine. And he writes, covetousness can make a person murder, tell lies, dishonor his parents, commit adultery, and in one way or another violate all of God's moral law. Selfish living and selfish praying always leads to war. If there is war on the inside, there will ultimately be war on the outside. And so selfish conflict within us, it produces a contentious life. And it doesn't just lead to conflict. And, you know, all of us experience conflict occasionally, but if we're not careful... We, we end up with a contentious lifestyle. Those kitchen fights that I had with my brother would go on and on. And sometimes they, you know, turn into kind of inadvertent violence. I remember one time I went to hit him on the, the shoulder because I was kind of torqued with him. And he held up a cheese grater and, and I still have the scars on my knuckles. Ouch, right? And, and we weren't really trying to murder each other, but we weren't too happy with each other. And we were contentious. And folks, often we're honest with ourselves. There's all kinds of ways to be contentious today. Within the church, outside the church, with our neighbors, with people we don't agree with on social media, about politics, about race, about COVID, you name it. And we have a contentious culture. And as Christians, our selfish desires can lead us into a contentious lifestyle. And I put on your outlines, how far into conflict does my selfishness take me? Think about it. Ask those around you. Because our selfish desire and that leads to conflict doesn't just affect us. It affects you know people we're in business with. It affects our neighbors. It affects our family. It affects our friends. It affects those that we love. It affects our relationship with God. How far into conflict does my selfishness take me? Not only do we need to consider the cause of the conflict, but now we look and we go at the end of verse 2 and, and all the way into verse 4, concede the consequences of the conflict. So we have the selfish desire leads to conflict, a contentious life. And what are some of the consequences of that? What, what's the cause? Okay, we, we're, we're selfish. We tend to be selfish. But what are some of the consequences? And we miss out on blessing. Look at the end of verse 2. You know, he starts, you desire, but you don't have, so you kill. That's the extreme example. You cover it, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And he says, you don't have because you don't ask God. And you think, well, wait a second, okay, I have these selfish desires, the things that I want, then if I ask God, is that what I get? If I ask for those pleasures I seek that someone else has, and i kind of envious, and I want those, and, 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 and that's no, that's not what he's saying. He is saying maybe we need to ask in a different direction, yes. Consider a different source of satisfaction, yes. Choose a different level of dependency, yes. Treat, treat God as the big Walmart in the sky, no. And so God wants, often wants to provide us a blessing that we'll miss out on because we're not asking in the right direction and we're not seeking him as a source of satisfaction. Instead, we're, we're trying to use him to get our selfish desires. And, and James understands that, and it's nothing new. You look at verse 3. When you ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives 
that you may spend what you get, and it's really this sense of squander, that you may squander what you get on your pleasures. And so we try to use God in a selfish manner. It's like he's the Kmart, he's the Walmart, he's the Costco in the sky, and bigger is better. So God, give me what I want. Okay, I don't, I don't want to fight with everybody else. So God, you just give, 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 give me what I want. James says, no, that's not what I'm saying. It's not what I'm saying. It's not about asking God to fulfill our selfish desires, but it's, it's we need to ask God and he provides a different source of satisfaction and he asks us to seek in a different direction, and is he going to fulfill all those selfish desires and pleasures? Of course not. I like what Constable said. He said, the only way to obtain satisfaction is to ask God to give it. He says, we don't have what God wants us to have because we do not ask him for these things. There are things we can have from God that we will not have unless we ask him for them. However, we often ask God for things to enable us to satisfy our own selfish desires. For example, we request more time, more money, more energy, so we can do things we desire, but God does not desire for us. And he says, what we need to ask him to give us is more desire for what he promises and commands. We also need less desire for what is contrary to his will for us. See, we, we, we're called to ask in a different direction. But instead, we miss out on blessing. Instead, we try to use God in a selfish manner. And what happens is, and James goes on, we end up damaging our relationship with God. And that's the next point there in verse 4. And he often says brothers, brothers, and sisters here in this, in this letter, but this time not so much. He says, well, you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And James is talking in very drastic terms again, just like he did with the kill thing. You know, conflict can lead to hatred, and the extreme form of that is murder. He says, here's what happens. And he calls us an adulterous people. Does that mean, well, no. So are all of us are having affairs if we're married and that kind of thing? He's not saying that, but he is calling it spiritual adultery. In the world here, remember, it's those that system, those values, that approach to life. It, it, that's the approach to life that acts as if God doesn't exist. And, and the world, it, it tends to actively work against God. And so we damage our relationship with God, just like in a marriage. And, and we're, in a sense, married to God the Father. And, and we're not to stray from that relationship. And instead of focusing on Him and His, His satisfaction and desires, we stray outside the relationship. So we commit spiritual adultery. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? And over my time as a pastor, I very sadly had to talk to couples that have had an affair of some kind, a physical affair in, in their marriage. And when I counsel people and one partner has broken the marital bond, I always, always, always counsel a complete breaking off of the marital infidelity and a complete breaking away from the adulterous behavior and relationship. And reconciliation is completely unavailable without it. And so there's this has to be this complete breaking away from that adulterous behavior or else this reconnection and reconciliation and health and relationship just won't work. And that's what we do with God. We commit spiritual adultery and we damage our relationship with Him. And we can't fix it unless we choose, you know what? That my key friend, my key relationship, my key source of satisfaction is going to be with God himself. That first question in the first verse and a half, how far into conflict does my selfishness take me? This next question, what conflict fallout am I experiencing now? What conflict fallout, this spreading sense of of uh, uh, unease uh, uh, and, and conflict and, and what are the consequences that are happening in my life because of this selfish desire that's expressed in hatred and in anger and division in my life and this conflict a contentious life what fallout am I am I experiencing just for example with someone that's had a an affair in a, a at a marriage relationship and there's some consequences of that. There's some fallout from that that's that's damaging and hurtful and it takes time to, even with confession and reconciliation, it, it takes time to fix things. 
But what conflict fallout am I experiencing now in my home with those I love, with those I care about on my, my on, online presence? Am I known for my contentious behavior? And is that affecting relationships with those around me? And so we got to concede the consequences of conflict that stems from our selfish desire. And there's some very real consequences, and it does very real damage in our relationship with God and with other people. Well, what's the... James hammers us over and over again, but he also provides some solutions. And we can craft a cure for this conflict that stems from selfish desire. So look at verse 5 and 6. And he says, And do you think, uh, Scripture says without reason, that he jealously, jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? And says, what in the world does that mean? Well, that's a real good question. This is one of the hardest verses. In fact, it's the hardest verse to interpret in James and one of the hardest verses to interpret in the Bible. In a very literal, literal translation, I like what one writer put. He said, if, I, if we're going to translate this literally from Greek into English, very literally, it would be this. And, this, and you can see why it's confusing. Or think you that vainly the scripture says to envy yearns the spirit which was made to dwell in you, but he gives great grace. And that includes a little bit of verse, beginning of verse 6. It's like, well, what in the world does that mean? And yikes, you know, is he talking about the Holy Spirit is jealous for our attentions to God? Or is it taken another way? We have a selfish nature that's a real problem, and God says we need to work on that. We're not quite sure, to be honest. And this is sometimes it's hard to understand exactly what James had in mind, and we were separated by time and history and language and culture and all those kind of things. But we do know this when we look at this verse, that it's about selfishness. Whether he's referring to the Holy Spirit, we're not quite sure. Whether he's referring to that spirit within us that tends to be selfish, we're not quite sure. But the bottom line, it leads us to, and I put on your outline is this, acknowledge the struggle with selfishness. If we want to have a cure for, for selfish desire and the conflict and the hatred and the division that comes from that, the first step is to acknowledge that we struggle with selfishness. Uh, many of us know the way that uh, people that go to AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, how they introduce themselves. In fact, it's kind of a cultural byline. And we say, you know, hi, my name is Brian, and I'm an alcoholic, right? And that's how they t talk and introduce themselves. And, and, and what about this, when we think of, of selfishness, how, how, about, how about this instead? Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm a selfaholic, right? See, we, we struggle with that. We struggle with selfishness, and we need to acknowledge that and admit our struggle with selfishness. Man, I want me first, and I'm guessing you want you first. That's how we're wired. But James goes on, and he gives us another cure for the conflict. We ask God for grace. Look at the beginning of verse 6. But he gives more grace. I love that. Just a little, little, little tidbit. We'll get to the rest in a second. But he gives more grace. Ask God for grace. See, we don't fix our selfishness problem. God does. And we don't earn it. He gifts it. And see how we can ask in a different direction. And instead of asking, asking God to fulfill our selfish desires, we say, God, will you give me your grace for my desire to be in a new direction? See, see we ask God for grace. God, give us that unmerited favor. We receive that at our salvation. And, and we live by that grace, not just at salvation, but day in and day out as we relive in, in relationship with the Lord. So the first step in this cure for that hatred, this selfish desire, is it one, admit it, acknowledge it, and then say, God, I, I can't fix it. I need, I need your grace. I, I, I need you to fix this problem in my life, and I, I can't earn my way into it, and I, I can't pull myself out of this, this mess. I need you to do it for me. And God says, okay, see. So we don't have because we don't ask, and it's not about having more things. It's about having more of God's grace. Finally, we admit our humble position before God. And he, he quotes from Scripture, another part of Scripture here, and that's why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So we acknowledge our struggle with selfishness. We ask God for grace, 
and then we admit our humble position before God. Because James reminds us, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And so it's not like we go before God and say, hey, God, I mean, look at me. Aren't you impressed? And so, God, you ought to be giving me what I ask because I'm so impressive. Of course not. It's just the opposite. We admit and we acknowledge, God, I'm, I'm not worthy. I, I come to you in humility. I, I come to you as the least of one of your children. And God, will you show mercy and grace toward me? I like what one writer says, Toward God, we must submit in humility. And see, we come to him with humility, and then we submit to his will. And instead of submitting ourselves to our constant battle of, for selfish desire and the conflict that comes with that, instead we submit with contrition. We submit to God in humility. That writer goes on and says, this means making what is of importance to him important to us, ordering our priorities in harmony with God's priorities. It means not living to fulfill our personal ambitions, but using our lives to fulfill his desires. Wow, that's different. <laughs> he says, submission is not identical to obedience. Submission involves the surrender of the will that results in obedience. See, if we want to be obedient to God, we first need to submit to his desire and his will. God, your will, your desires, not mine. Mine tend to be selfish and kind of messed up, and it leads to conflict with you and other people. See, bottom line here, we put this all together, and I put it on your, on your outlines with that key question, that last key question in red there. And that, that second one was, what conflict uh, fallout am I experiencing now? But when we look at this last one, am I working toward, am I heading toward, am I moving towards stardom or servanthood? Am I heading toward this success, this worldly success mentality that says, man, I got to get all these things. I got to make it happen. I got to do it myself. I, I've got it. It's about me. Am I working towards stardom or am I heading toward servanthood? See, that's that humility part, right? We acknowledge our struggle with selfish desire. We ask God, hey, God, provide that unmerited favor, that grace toward us, that admit our humble position, and that's a position of a servant. If you look on the bottom of your outlines, you can see that quote in blue. I'm going to read it. Our God is also merciful, gracious, all-loving, and willingly supplies all that we need to meet his all-encompassing demands. As Augustine has said, and the great Augustine from about 350 years after the time of Christ, and, and a Christian philosopher, and we're still reading his writings today, very influential throughout church history. And many think, you know, maybe just like after the Apostle Paul, uh, you know, obviously Apostle Paul wrote a lot of, of, of the New Testament, but after the Apostle Paul, Augustine's right, 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 you know, right next to him there in terms of his influence. As Augustine has said, God gives what he demands. Don't you love that? Hey, I want you to do this. By the way, I'm going to give you all the strength and all the ability. I'm going to give it to you so you can do it. <laughs> there is, however, a requirement for the experience of this grace, humility. God's gift of sustaining grace can be received only by those willing to admit their need and accept the gift. The proud, on the other hand, meet only resistance from God. And then we're going to get into that more next, next week. See, am I working toward stardom, personal stardom, or am I working toward servanthood? That's a great question. And folks, as we head toward the Lord's table, and I hope you have your supplies I do over here with me, I have the bread and the cup. You know, Jesus gave a wonderful example. If anybody, when he was on earth, could have been the star! <laughs> would have been Jesus, but he said, no, I'm going to, you know, wash your feet. And he took the role of a servant, and he washed the disciples' feet. And he says, I want you to go and do likewise. And he not only washed our feet, he washed our sins away when he went and took uh, the sacrifice for us on the cross. And he took our place, that substitutionary atonement, right? He took our place. And Jesus became a servant on our behalf. And he says, I want you to do that as well. So many of us, we live in a conflictive time. And we're contentious. And some of us, we're proud of it. God says, no, no, I want you to submit. 
want you to submit and move away from those selfish desires. Move away from that life of conflict and acknowledge your struggle with selfish desire and admit um, and ask for God's grace and that admit our humble position before God. And we come to God with humility. And so when we receive grace and mercy from God, we do that not proud, but we do that not as a superstar, but as a servant responding to who God is. So when we celebrate the Lord's table, we remember the broken body and blood of Jesus Christ, right? And his shed blood for forgiveness of sins. And we do that with contrition and with submission. So let's partake of the bread together. And when, the night before he died, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's partake. In the same way, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake. Folks, as we start this new section, Christ wants us to submit with contrition, to turn from hatred into humility. He wants us to come to the foot of the cross in humility, receive grace, ask for it, and when we ask for it, he gives it, and say, God, continue to give me that grace that turns my desires in a new direction. Let's pray. Father, may we work towards servanthood and not toward superstardom. <laughs> we don't need any more celebrities. We need people that are servants. So God, guide us. Uh, graciously give. We need it. This battle we can't fix on our own. We are so selfish, God. You, we don't have to introduce ourselves to you as selfish. You know already. But we admit it to you. We confess. And we so thank you for your grace and your mercy. It's the basis of our salvation and relationship. It's also the basis of how you want us to approach life, where we submit to you with contrition. And then we turn this kind of conflictive, contentious life and angry and selfish desire life into one of humility that seeks peace, that we're peacemakers as we saw already. And that peace that is founded in the grace we've received at the foot of the cross. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.